It is Palm Sunday, 1461, and on a narrow road north of the town of Pontefract, an army is marching into a blistering Yorkshire snowstorm. Glad to still possess their winter clothes, despite the supposed spring season, they carry their unstrung bows and halberds slung across their backs, held with hands that all could make use of a second pair of gloves. In the swirling gale, their numbers are uncertain, with some men claiming that they are barely a few hundred, while others swear that they are no fewer than ten thousand. Their leader too is a matter of debate for those who are not too cold or too weary to confer in low tones amongst the ranks. They are the Duke of Norfolk's company to a man, but it is known that Norfolk is sick, an old man for whom this march is too great a task. In Norfolk's place, it is said that Sir John Howard has taken command of the army, but others say that it is Walter Blount who is issuing orders. In addition to their unknown numbers and vague commander, the force are also unaware of their ultimate destination. This plays on the mind of men who are otherwise concentrating on staying in line while unable to see much farther than the back of the head in front of them. But for all the rush of their hasty breakfast, the quick prayers muttered by the chaplains to mark the holy day and the forced march north, these tough men of East Anglia are ready for a fight. Most, if not all of them, have fought before, and they are ready to throw themselves once more into the moor and wager of battle. The first signs that this day will bring action comes as they approach the crossing over the river Eyre at Ferrybridge. Pickets and sentries salute their officers, pointing them forward, north towards the unseen villages, behind the woods in the distance. The men look either side of the road, where bodies still lie stacked from fresh action. Some kind of confused attack for the bridge, certainly less than a day previous. They take heart from the fact that it is their side which now controls the crossing, for it means that the enemy may be on the run, even scared and willing to come to terms. We all like to study the past, but what about our own past? After all, researching your own history helps you understand who you are. And you can learn about your family history with our sponsor, My Heritage. They are the number one family history service and they provide an easy and fun way to build your family tree and discover your origins, as well as find new relatives. You can just enter a few names into your family tree, and My Heritage will automatically find new information from a collection of over 19 billion records from people around the world curious to learn about their ancestors. Best yet, with the Instant Discoveries feature, you can add an entire family branch to your tree with a click of a button. And once you complete your family tree, you can print it out in different elegant styles. Another cool feature is that you can color old family photos. You can also repair damaged photographs, and even bring your ancestors to life by animating their images. Sign up for a 14-day free trial using my link below to discover your family history and enjoy all the amazing features my heritage has to offer. To truly know yourself, you must learn about your past. Start today with my heritage. Onward up the old London road, and then by some woods to their right, keeping close to the tree line before the road rises in an incline and their officers give the order to enter battle formation. A rumble can be heard now, a distant rattle and commotion that is just perceptible over the sound of the wind and snow and orders lashing in their ears. Forming up, their size is still a mystery to most, but they have a better idea that they are a strong force, a couple of thousand at least. Captains on horseback roar at them to stay in line. Others prowl behind to make sure that none are guilty of wavering. And the Duke of Norfolk's men ascend the ridge and wait to see what is on the other side. The sight that greets them is unlike anything even the most hardened veterans have gazed on in their lives. 
The whole countryside seems to have been overrun with men and horses in arms, and the scale of the battle takes their breath away and silences their company to a man. Their enemy, the Lancastrians, seem to be spread out over a wide ridge, ringed with woods interspersed to the east and west, while a river winds and sets the limit of the western side. Norfolk's allies, the Yorkists, seem to be charging down from a slightly flatter ridge, crashing into the advancing Lancastrians, who for some reason appear to have given up the high ground. Officers with practiced eyes scan the battle lines, and then all of a sudden they see what they are searching for, the reason for them to rush into this titanic battle. Look there, they shout, swords pointing at a tall battle standard in the middle of the Yorkist line. Look there, and behold your king fight. The East Anglians peer down, and sure enough, in the very middle of the line, surrounded by a guard over which he towers in golden armor, is the unmistakable figure of Edward. The son of the Duke of York and newly declared king, swings a war axe to and fro as though he were clearing ditches. Lancastrians veer backward at his approach, and he alone seems to be powering the Yorkist advance, every other man following in his stead. Towering a foot higher than the average man, it is a sight that stirs even the most disinclined man among Norfolk's force, and when their officers ask whether they are ready to charge in his name and cause, they cry with full throats that they are. As all hangs in the balance, Norfolk's men roll the dice, and the wheel begins to spin to an uncertain conclusion. Those already on the battlefield look around in alarm at their cacophonous arrival, while the storm that had already been lashing them for hours reaches a simultaneous crescendo. The Norfolk men collide with the left flank of the Lancastrian army, and the snow blocks out the sight of what happens next. In the aftermath of the Christmas time Battle of Wakefield in late December 1461, events moved quickly in England. The heads of Richard, Duke of York, and his second son, Edmund, Earl of Rutland, were put on display before the ancient city. York had been named heir to Henry VI's throne, but attempted to seize power from the unstable and mentally incapable monarch and paid the price. The Queen, Margaret of Anjou, moved south from Scotland where she had been attempting to solicit aid for her husband Henry VI's cause, and she joined her forces to the victors of Wakefield, Henry Duke of Somerset, and Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland. A little over a month after the fateful battle in which his father and brother had been lured into fighting what seemed a small band of knights, only to be ambushed by a hidden enemy, Edward, son of the Duke of York, distinguishes himself in a battle with Welsh Lancastrians, led by Owen Tudor, when he defeats them at the Battle of Mortimer's Cross in Herefordshire. A solar event on the morning of the battle, a parhelion in which three suns were seen to rise at once, gave Edward a supernatural standing in the eyes of his army and many commoners, and it led to his adoption of a new standard called the Sun in Splendor. This remarkable cosmological event echoed that of Constantine the Great prior to the Battle of the Milvian Bridge in 312 AD, and along with the 18-year-old Edward's regal yet warrior-like appearance, the Orchists once again had a champion who was capable of winning battles and ruling in the vein of his great Plantagenet predecessors. For men who had taken up the Yorkist cause, like the Earl of Warwick and Duke of Norfolk, victory became a pressing issue when the combined Lancastrian forces won a victory against them at the Second Battle of St. Albans on the 17th of February. After freeing Henry VI from the retreating forces of Warwick and Norfolk, Margaret prevailed on her son to put the king's former guards, William, First Baron Bonville, and Sir Thomas Kiriel, both known as esteemed and honorable men, to death. 
Henry VI seems to have protested this action, but the Queen and their seven-year-old son, Edward of Westminster, overruled him. As the news of the execution spread, it seemed to many English that the Lancastrians now had a ruler that was doubly damned by her sex and foreign nationality, as well as a weak and ineffectual king and his vicious heir. London made it clear that the Lancastrian leadership would not be welcomed, and the city leadership made ready to oppose their army's arrival. Margaret Somerset and Northumberland assessed their strategic situation, with Edward still at large and gathering strength, as well as the still dangerous Warwick and Norfolk, and decided that a siege in the present circumstances was at risk of a counterattack and envelopment. The Lancastrians moved back north. The Yorkists marched toward the capital in their stead, and Edward entered the city on the 26th of February. Joined by Warwick and Norfolk, there was a flurry of negotiations, and by the 1st of March, those present, including the powerful burghers of the city, had proclaimed Edward as king. A formal coronation took place on the 4th, but there was no time for lavish and intricate ceremony. Instead, Norfolk left the city the next day to raise troops in the east, while Warwick followed two days later to levy soldiers in the west. On the 11th, William Neville, Baron Falkenberg, marched north, leading Edward's main force. The new king followed him at some point in the next 48 hours. Falkenberg, like Warwick and Norfolk, as well as Somerset and Northumberland on the Lancastrian side, was a man of his era. A soldier knight, he was in his mid-fifties at the time of Edward's accession, and his career had seen him fighting for more than 30 years on the Scottish borders and the wars in France. Before his and Warwick's switch to the Yorkist side, Falkenberg had also been entrusted with diplomatic missions by the Crown, and Edward was well served by such experienced commanders. On the 22nd of March, Edward and Falkenberg were in Nottingham, picking up levies as they moved, and around five days later, the 27th, they had joined forces with Warwick and were at Pontefract. Warwick would have sent word ahead and then recounted in detail to his monarch and allies how he had put to death and beheaded the bastard of Exeter, one of the many illegitimate sons of Sir Henry Holland, the Duke of Exeter. The bastard of Exeter was said to have led the mob that had lynched Warwick's father in terrible fashion following the Battle of Wakefield, and Warwick now took his vengeance by similar means. Prior to Wakefield, there had mostly been a semblance of adherence to law in regard to executions, but the war had now moved into a new and brutal stage. Vengeance and the elimination of family and retainers became the common practice. The young King Edward, whose father's dead and mutilated body had been paraded through the streets of York with a bloodied paper crown a mere eight weeks earlier, was content to pay his enemies back in their own coin. Despite the elevation of his victory at Mortimer's Cross, his subsequent elevation to the throne, and the massing of his forces on the road to the north, one detail that gave him pause was the continued absence of Norfolk. Though the Duke was in ill health, meaning his own personal involvement in the coming struggle was always in question, his forces were considerable, even with the strength that Edward had already amassed, and the Norfolk name brought great prestige and legitimacy to the Yorkist cause. In the city of York, the Lancastrians were in a similarly pressed situation. Strategically, they could not retreat any further, as York was the last major city in northern England, and moving any further would take them into the wilds approaching the Scottish marches. The Scottish contingents raised by Margaret had already left and deserted home following the profitable victory at St. Albans and the prospect of a hard fight in the south. Their English contingents would not be slow in following them should the cause seem lost. With a force that was said to number in the tens of thousands, certainly larger than any in English history, Margaret and her Lancastrians were, 
to put it bluntly, in a position where they needed to use it or lose it. On receiving word that Edward and his forces were now little more than 30 miles to the south in Pontefract, Somerset led the Lancastrian army out of the city gates. There, they would have seen the decomposing head of Richard, Duke of York, and his son Edmund, along with spaces that Margaret of Anjou had ordered be made for the new usurper Edward and his traitorous commanders. The Queen stayed in the city, along with King Henry and Prince Edward, while their army moved south to engage the approaching Yorkists along the old London road. Somerset had reached the village of Tadcaster before pressing on again over the River Wharf and reaching the settlement of Towton. With his own well-honed sense of strategy and tactics, Somerset chose his ground just southwest, again of the village, on a wide range between the Renshaw Woods to the east and the Castle Hill Wood and Cock River to the west. The ground was well chosen from a military perspective. Placing the Lancastrian line on the ridge ensured that the approaching Yorkists would have to advance uphill once battle was joined, and while the plateau provided enough width to deploy their entire host in strength, the woods and river on the fringes prohibited any kind of envelopment or flanking maneuver. Somerset and Northumberland, as well as the Duke of Exeter, were in a strong position as their army made camp, and they sent a force of perhaps 500 mounted men forward late on the 27th or very early in the morning of the 28th of March. It was this Lancastrian unit that made first contact with the Yorkists when they came upon an advance unit of Edwards which had been attempting to repair a river crossing at Ferry Bridge on the River Eyre. The Lancastrians were led by two barons, Clifford and Neville, the latter of whom was related to one of the leaders of the Yorkist unit, Warwick's half-brother, the Bastard of Salisbury. The commander of the Yorkist contingent Lord Fitzwalter was killed quickly in the ambush, and the result was a quick rout. The Lancastrians took control of the river crossing. Warwick, hearing of the clash, rode forward to assess the situation, and on seeing the Lancastrian horsemen milling on the south side of the river, he rode in haste to report to Edward. The king was still likely in Pontefract, a couple of miles distant, but receiving Warwick's hurried revelation, he moved in force to Ferry Bridge. The Yorkist counterattack pushed Clifford and Neville's units back onto the far side of the river, but there they formed up on the remains of the bridge and created a bottleneck. Unable to get around the Lancastrians, Edward and his commanders had to funnel their forces in equal numbers to the enemy on the bridge, and thus lost their advantage. In a foreshadowing of the carnage to come, as many as 3,000 perished in hours of angry fighting for the crossing, before Edward ordered Falkenberg to ride with a company and cross the river at Castleford. This action would have taken some time, as Falkenberg's company might have had to ride back through Pontefract and then on again until he reached the old Roman Ridge Road, before turning north once more to Castleford, riding almost in a large circle. Falkenberg bore down on the Lancastrians and scattered them, allowing Edward to finally press forward over the river. The mounted Yorkist forces pursued the retreating Clifford and Neville, the chase leading them almost back to Somerset and Northumberland's position with the main Lancastrian force. Before they reached safety, however, Clifford and Neville were both cut down by Falkenberg in Dinting Dale, just north of Saxton. Falkenberg might have become aware of the enemy position at this point, but in any event, Edward was already moving the Yorkist army across the air, and they were heading at pace to the hamlet of Sherburne in Elmet, where they set the Yorkist camp and headquarters. Another advanced camp was set up in the environs of Saxton. 
In these three positions, the Yorkist and Lancastrians passed an uneasy night. Facing a powerful, well-provisioned army in a superior position after a day of suffering high casualties over a minor river crossing, and still without one of his foremost captains in the absent Norfolk, Edward's situation was looking far less certain than it had just 24 hours earlier. Yet the young king gave no indication of wavering in the task ahead. Like the Lancastrians, Edward had little choice but to fight his enemy. Any kind of delay or prevarication would be interpreted as a sign of weakness or indecision, precisely the characteristics his side were using as justification for the removal of Henry VI. At all costs, Edward had to present himself as the antithesis of that unlucky monarch. On Palm Sunday morning, the rested and well-provisioned Lancastrian army began its deployment over the 100-foot-high ridge south of Towton, where its leaders would have found what shelter they could the previous night. At 1,000 yards in width, it provided them with an ample location to fully extend their prodigious numbers. Edward's commanders and forward units would have been aware of his army's smaller stature, likely from the moment Falkenberg moved the vanguard into position from where it had spent the night in the village of Saxton. Edward, meanwhile, was moving forward with the main host from the rear position at Sherburn in Elmet. Though chroniclers and contemporary writers gave figures as high as 200,000 on both sides when describing the number of participants in the battle, it is certain that both Edward and Somerset commanded armies far in excess of the norm for the period, and almost certainly larger than any seen in medieval England before or after. Sober modern analysis estimates that Edward commanded 20,000 men at the outset of the fighting in the marshy and partially flooded Yorkshire meadows, while Somerset and Northumberland comfortably entered the engagement with 25,000. The total could well have been slightly higher, meaning that 3% of the entire population of England was present at the fighting that day. These numbers for the common folk are quite extraordinary, but the numbers of nobility are greater still. With four dukes, four earls and twenty barons in the lines, three quarters of England's nobility were also shouldering the fight to decide its monarch. Snow began to fall as the Lancastrians watched the Yorkists appear over the opposite ridge, with the lower stretches of North Acres and Towton Dale between them. By full light at nine o'clock, the two main armies were in position and their formations had taken shape. Both armies were arrayed in three main contingents or battles, with Falkenberg leading a forward unit of Edward's army, numbering perhaps 10,000 men. Edward was just rear of this force on the left flank, while Warwick likely took up the right side. Warwick had received a leg wound in the fighting at Ferry Bridge the previous day, and it is possible that he was relaying orders rather than leading his battle in person. On the Lancastrian side, Somerset was in command of the central battle, while Northumberland, Exeter and Sir Andrew Trollope, a common-born knight who had originally fought on the Yorkist side before defecting to the Lancastrians just prior to the Battle of Wakefield, led the others. It was said that the ruse of the hidden cavalry force that had hoodwinked Edward's father at Wakefield was Trollope's invention, and such was Edward's wrath for his former ally that he had placed a bounty of 100 pounds on Trollope's head. The horses of dismounted knights as well as light cavalry contingents were at the rear of Edward's army, likely Somerset's army also, and these would be called into the fighting as needed in the circumstances. The light cavalry also served as a military police for those members of their own army who might lose their nerve and attempt to flee the field. They were given the descriptive nickname Prickers, indicating the manner in which they encouraged their panicked men to get back into the press in the middle of a fight. 
It was incontestable that the Lancastrians had the superior position at the outset of the battle, being in greater numbers, rested, and on the higher ground. The one factor that was not in their favor, however, was the weather, and this was where Falkenberg decided to make his play. Observing that the heavy wind and snow was blowing directly at the Lancastrians, he filled his vanguard with archers and brought them forward to fire on the Lancastrian standard on the Towton Ridge. Archery exchanges were de rigueur in the opening engagements of English battles. But Falkenberg had his companies fire single volleys and then stay in place or withdraw a short distance. With the assistance of the wind, they were able to shoot deep into the Lancastrian ranks, causing consternation and mounting casualties. The Lancastrian replies into the wind fell short of the Yorkist lines, and Falkenberg began timing his attacks with precision, loosing hundreds of arrows and then rushing back out of range. With perhaps 20,000 archers firing simultaneously, and each one capable of shooting at a sustained pace of seven or eight arrows a minute, up to 12 if they pressed, the already dark grey skies would have looked as though they were teeming with gigantic swarms of rolling hornets, the deadly hiss of the bolt in flight just before it struck and incapacitated, invisible until dropped from the sky and brought agony. 100,000 arrows flew back and forth every minute, ripping and sowing death and injury on a plain half a mile wide. Within a very short time, the Lancastrians were suffering from frustration and ever-mounting losses, their rage growing as their archers failed to make an impression on the enemy. This was coupled with indignation as their supplies of arrows began to run short, but the Yorkists were able to simply pluck the fallen Lancastrian arrows from the ground and shoot them back at the ridge. Falkenberg was careful to warn his men to take only half the fallen arrows, leaving the rest in place as an obstacle to the advance he anticipated was forthcoming in short order. The cool heads in the Yorkist front line contrasted with chagrin in the Lancastrian leadership. Left with the choice to see discipline and his numerical advantage collapse or to abandon the high ground, Somerset chose the latter, and Falkenberg's plan came to fruition. The Lancastrians began to march down from the ridge. While withdrawing their archers to the rear and bringing forward the infantry armed with halberds, spears, and poleaxe, the leadership of both armies told their men that no quarter was to be given to the enemy. Were the leadership of either side to be captured, they knew that they were as good as dead, and they expected their armies to fight under those terms. Edward is supposed to have addressed his soldiers on the battlefield, telling them that should any man not wish to fight, he should leave now. But Edward would share the battle with those who stayed, and raising his axe, he placed himself and his standard in the front line. On the Lancastrian side, Somerset flew the royal standard of Henry VI, but he could not hope to match the presence of Edward. This counted for much when the two armies met at the foot of the Towton Ridge, the determined mood of the army's standing orders manifesting itself in the violence that by now had become the standard of the prolonged civil conflict. There was no fainting or skirmishing, no polite angling or jabbing with the long end of a spear. Instead, the vanguards of both armies enmeshed themselves in trying to kill as many of the enemy as fate allowed, before fate itself intervened and took them first. Armor and protection in both Lancastrian armies varied from the simple peasant wearing a padded jacket, to the man who could afford chain mail and helmet, to the warrior knights who were clad head to toe in costly and even foreign-made sheathing. The sharpened melee weapons, along with heavier implements like hammers, maces, and axes, cleaved terrible wounds. Skulls were shattered, jaws broken, limbs pummeled until they snapped. Incredibly, even for a battle between armies of this size in the period, the fighting was not a stop-and-start affair, 
nor did it end quickly. Rather, thousands of men took their part in the dogfight, throwing themselves forward when the comrades in front had fallen, finding an enemy where they could, and inflicting the most awful of blows upon them. Many of the new recruits in Edward's army would have seen their homes, villages and towns sacked and pillaged in recent months by the Lancastrian army in its southern advance and subsequent withdrawal. Many of the northern Lancastrian rank and file had similar insults inflicted on them by Yorkist rebels. This was their opportunity to take revenge, to spill the bad blood that has been festering across England for years. For a long time, the battle was suspended in equal contest, men being fed into the grinder of the front line, with neither side moving forward or back. But then the Yorkist right seemed to give way. The Lancastrian advantage in numbers was beginning to show itself. Edward took decisive action and moved over to the right flank where his presence buoyed the hard-pressed front line and reinvigorated the fighting. But it is at this point that Somerset, with the likely influence of Trollope, revealed his trap. Hundreds of mounted Lancastrians charged out from a hidden position in the Castle Hill Wood, breaking at full gallop into the Yorkist left wing. For Edward, it was like a nightmare had come in real life. The same tactic had killed his father and brother just weeks earlier, and now he was isolated on the already faltering right wing, while his left was now in serious danger of collapse. The Yorkist army, already outnumbered, survived the shock of the ambush just barely, but it was now fighting an enemy that looked as though it would surround them at any moment. What likely saved them, apart from their own rock-solid determination, was that Falkenberg's tactic of drawing the Lancastrians into the advance early in the battle meant that the Yorkists were not as far up the ridge as they might perhaps have been otherwise, and so the cavalry attacks ran into their flank rather than all the way around to their rear. Nevertheless, the Yorkists were now in a dire situation. Their one talisman is Edward, probably visible from all around the battlefield. And as he fought on, so did they. But the Lancastrians on the ridge can see the end is not far in the distance. Once again, though, fate threw another sidelong dice into the course of history, and figures began to appear very distantly at the rear of the Yorkist right. The Lancastrians watching the battle from the high ridge could see them dimly through the still pounding snow, but they were there, and their numbers were growing every moment. It was Norfolk's men. Thousands of fresh fighters culled over the preceding weeks from the eastern reaches of the country, now streaming out from the same road by which the Yorkist army had arrived that morning. Yorkist cheers and Norfolk's war cries filled the battlefield, and with the new grit and energy afforded by their allies, the Yorkists began to push the Lancastrians back. Norfolk's arrival, along with Edward's continued battling, is decisive, and the Lancastrians begin to give way. The first deserters begin to withdraw from the rear line, standing back instead of pressing forward. Then whole units and companies begin to disengage and withdraw back towards Towton. Very quickly, the Lancastrian forward units would have become aware that they were fighting alone, the leadership having deserted it and left in its place just the lonely flag of Henry VI. By contrast, Edward in his golden armor was now rampaging forward. Though they had fought bravely through the day, the survivors of the Lancastrian army broke and ran. Seeing the victory and the complete collapse of the enemy, the Yorkists brought forward the light cavalry and the fresh mounts from their rear and pursued, cutting down thousands of the enemy or running them either into the River Cock or the Wharf, where more drowned in the freezing and deep waters. The killing ground runs red with blood. Northumberland and Trollope were killed either in the fighting or just after Norfolk's arrival, while Somerset managed to flee successfully, 
but the Lancastrian leadership fled the city of York later that night. Henry VI, his son, and Margaret left the city for Scotland, with Somerset allegedly in their company after a rush from the battlefield at Towton. Edward entered the city the next day, and the heads of his father and brother over the gates were replaced with those of his own dead enemies. The Wars of the Roses were not finished, but after possibly the largest battle ever fought on its soil, England had a new king, a monarch the very opposite of his predecessor in every form and likeness. A new era began but the echoes of what its creation had cost would ring for the ages in the name given to the field on which the Battle of Towton had been fought. The Bloody Meadow. Don't forget to try out my heritage using my link below. Sign up for a 14-day free trial and start discovering your family history. If you enjoyed watching, attack the like button and subscribe, and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. Support us on Patreon and get early access to our videos for as little as $1, or click the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.